first Marvel movie and probably one of the biggest blockbusters of the year. Let's get right into Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Two months after defeating Ronan, the Guardians are cavorting around the universe and incur the wrath of the Sovereignty, an uppity group of gold-skinned superior types who chase them around the galaxy. The Guardians are narrowly saved by the mysterious Ego, who turns out to be Peter's dad. Everything else is sort of spoiler territory, which will be clearly marked in the review and which I will get into later. It's not a terrible plot, but it is sort of dull. I don't really know even where to say spoilers about the plot, because the thing is is that it's very clear right from the start that something is off with Ego. Not only that, but the Sovereignty are clearly just Disc 1 mini-boss baddies. They don't really have the motivation to be a lead villain in a film. That said, Doctor Strange didn't really have any motivation for its villain and it made a fuckload of money, so who am I to say? The most striking thing for me was that the plot felt sort of unoriginal, and I don't mean that in a vague way, I mean specifically it felt like the Future Armor episode, A Bicyclops Built for Two. In that episode, Leela discovers another Cyclops who invites her to their home planet. She discovers a rich place of beauty and ornate buildings, but Fry thinks it's too good to be true, and it turns out it's a con. So basically, this. Being original is kind of overrated as far as films are concerned. You don't really have to have an original plot to be a good film. After all, Star Wars is basically just a pastiche of the Flash Gordon serials. And that's something that you can see in great detail on my Ghost in the Shell review. There's a commenter called Claire Rousseau who has a really cool channel looking at books and graphic novels and stuff. She goes into depth on it there, so it's worth having a look at. The problem with being unoriginal is that your execution has to be flawless, which it isn't really here. And it makes it harder to engage with the characters because you feel like you've seen the scenarios they're in before, they don't really feel fresh like they're happening right now. So an example of that, there's two stock scenes in this film. One of them is a friendly derivation on the whole we're not so different you and I scene where Yondu and Rocket kind of face off and realise they have really similar backgrounds. That's a boring type of scene because it's basically the writer just lining up the themes for you and telling you what's going on in terms of the character arc in the film. And there's a pretty much line for line why can't you be happy for me scene in the film as well between Gamora and Star-Lord when she's trying to tell him that there's something wrong with the planet. And throughout all of this Rocket basically spends almost the entirety of the film just hanging out with Yondu on the Ravager show and that's a plot that, although it resolves, doesn't really contribute to the action of the film overall. That's almost as bad but not quite as frustrating as the Thor plot in Age of Ultron, which never really gets resolved and has nothing to do with the main plot of the film. So to recap, we end up with a slightly derivative plot where about a quarter of the characters are just doing busy work to fill up the film's not inconsiderable 2 hours 15 minute runtime. Not exactly top flight, kind of a C plus for the plot I think. A big problem I had with the original Guardians of the Galaxy was that I didn't really know the characters very well because they were running around so much that it was kind of hard to actually get any character development in there. This film goes out of its way to address that, which I think is great. The problem is, is that they go too far and actually as a result a lot of these character development scenes feel sort of interminable and they just drag. The thing about character development is you can't just have characters sit in a room, you sort of have to commit to them having an arc in the film. So a good example of that in this movie is Yondu. I think he has a pretty full arc. What this film really wants to do, and a big problem of the Marvel Cinematic Universe overall, is just put its characters in a sort of holding pattern where nothing really changes. A case in point is a scene between Star-Lord and Gamora where he asks her to explain what the whole unspoken thing they have between them is. That could be an interesting scene and it was a main part of the plot of the first movie, but ultimately that doesn't develop at all throughout the film. There is still an unspoken thing at the end of the movie, and just because they reference cheers and make fun about how the audiences would leave if that thing was resolved, doesn't justify that thing not being resolved, or at least developed. You may recognise this as the problem that plagued Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in its first season, which was instead of having a properly developing arc with Coulson, they just went, ah, Tahiti. Oh, it's a magical place, and they just said that once an episode and never really developed anything around it. Just playing lip service to character development doesn't mean character development exists. And this is where you start to see the cracks with the characters in the film. Drax, who I felt was one of the high points of the previous film, is essentially a one-note comic relief character here. His whole joke is just laughing too loud at inappropriate moments. It happens like seven times in the first 20 minutes of the movie. Rocket and Yondu, who are characters around which a lot of the emotional stuff in the film revolves, are apparently just complete sociopaths, as evidenced by a scene when they murder a full ship of people. People who, up until like the day before, were Yondu's crew, and they'd been around him forever. So he basically goes and murders a whole load of people who were previously his mates, granted they've done wrong to him since, 
and just like cackles his whole way through it, as does Rocket. Star-Lord, despite being the nominal main character, has very little to do in the movie. He spends most of it standing around passively listening to Kurt Russell. Of the recurring characters, Gamora and Nebula have the most complete and compelling arc. Their relationship changes and grows as the film progresses, and that's communicated through a really good action sequence um, in kind of the latter third of the movie. As for the new characters, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Ego is a really interesting villain. He's got an interesting approach to what he's doing and it's a good performance from Kurt Russell. It's very charismatic and sort of like oily and slimy and nasty. Unfortunately, all that charisma really does is mask the fact that his motivations aren't very clear and his plan is kind of dumb. If you think about it, he's trying to get Star-Lord involved in this genocidal plan that he's got. And he wants to do that because Star-Lord's got these celestial powers that make him like really super powerful and also immortal. The reason in the end why Star-Lord doesn't go along with it is because he loves his family and friends too much, right? So I don't understand why having waited for literally millennia to do this, Ego couldn't just wait like an extra hundred years for all of Star-Lord's friends and families to die. Probably not that compelling a plot for a movie, is it? Just them sitting around playing backgammon for a hundred years. Mantis is a bit of an interesting one. In the poster and trailer, I thought that she looked goofy and kind of stupid, but in the film, I thought her performance was pretty good. She was kind of compelling. But then you've got the ego problem all over again, which is it's not exactly clear why she goes along with Ego's plan for so long, except out of some sort of misplaced loyalty. Is it just me, or is she also complicit in the death of all those kids of Ego? Like, surely she's been aware of that and sort of just going along with it for however long she's been alive. How well made is the film? How good does it look? How well directed is it? James Gunn is a really good director. I love Super. I love Sliver. I think he's a good director and I think he's subversive and interesting a lot of the time. One thing this movie does really well that Marvel has predominantly sucked at in the last couple of movies they've made is that it has a very consistent and concrete tone and approach throughout the film. That's the sign of a really stable and happy director behind the camera. Your first shot in Doctor Strange is just of a bell in a cloister, it's not even ringing. And then the camera just pans over to uh, like a semi-wide of a courtyard and then cuts to another wide over the top of it. That's his first shot, that's what he did. This one has a big wide of American countryside with this classic rock playing as it slowly pushes in on a sports car. Like that's an opening to a movie. You've got a bit with Baby Groot kind of dancing his way through an action sequence while it goes on in the background set to ELO. That's a statement of intent from the director to the audience saying this is the kind of film you're gonna see. For me, I think it leans on the nostalgia a little too heavily and it features this prominent jukebox soundtrack which really raids the classic rock treasure chest to more succinctly manipulate the audience's emotion. I think it overuses that trick. It uses a lot of music and that makes the film feel kind of jumbled sometimes, like you're running from one track to another. And they also use it weirdly to distance you from how nasty some of what's going on on screen is. When Yondu and Rocket are murdering like a hundred people but it's set to a pop song, the audience can sort of tap their feet, click their fingers along and it feels soft and nice. I think that's a weird choice. I think that's a way for the audience to be distanced from what's actually going on, which is two of the main characters taking glee and murdering a load of people. They're murdering a group of like old friends basically and just laughing about it. That's not cool. I don't think Han Solo would do that. It doesn't make sense to me to have two heroes doing that in a movie. And that's one thing I just briefly want to touch on. Don't don't let anyone make out this film is like fun and poppy. It's it's grim. People die. There's like a million people plus die in the film on the, on the course of what Ego does as his kind of like evil plan. And also, you know, just main characters murder a fuckload of people. Rocket actually murders like 50 odd people on screen and then is like, gosh, I wish I could have murdered more people. And that's a joke. Like they, they're like, ha ha ha, you're always trying to kill people. I think it's weird for a movie to be so, so violent so openly and then also be like, lol, it doesn't matter. This violence doesn't matter. When we kill people, it's fine. And it sounds a bit weird because Super and Sliver, like I said, films I really like, both by James Gunn, both that feature quite severe violence in certain ways. But I think in those movies, he does something more subversive with it. Super's a really complex film. I think it's really clever. And a lot of what it gets away with is because it pushes it so far and it really wants you to confront the meaning of what that guy's doing in that context. This film doesn't want you to confront anything. This film wants you to just eat popcorn and kind of glaze over. And I think that's wrong. I think that's fundamentally wrong. It just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. But don't worry, it's not grim. It's funny. It's, it's, it's 70s, 80s pop. It's Fleetwood Mac, yay. It's murder, it's Fleetwood Mac. It's soft, it's funny, yay. So biggest thing for me in a movie is, does it make me feel? I think the movie wants to be funny and I think it predominantly fails to do that. A lot of the jokes fell flat. And bear in mind, I saw this in a midnight screening, right? So diehard fans on release night, watching it at midnight, 
very few belly laughs. There are about three belly laughs in the whole movie. And that's not really what you want for a film that has predominantly billed itself as being a comedic romp. The movie tries to make you feel sad about Yondu's death at the end, and that kind of fell flat for me as well, and I've got a couple of reasons why. One, because it was so heavily telegraphed and foreshadowed that it just didn't surprise me when it showed up. Two, because Mantis was basically guilty of the same crimes, but she got off scot-free. Three, because the guy is a frequent and unrepentant murderer. Four, because in the face of the rampant destruction and death that's just swept throughout the galaxy, I find it hard to empathise with one single death that's affecting the main characters. But hey, here's a CGI raccoon crying. I mean, the raccoon doesn't value life, that's been established. He doesn't He doesn't care about people in general, he doesn't think life has any inherent value. He throws away the gift of life on a regular basis, he takes it from people callously while laughing, just genuinely throughout the film. But you know, he's sad because his mate died, and there's a little tear on the cartoon raccoon's face. It's voiced by Oscar-winning Bradley Cooper there, so... Feelings. You know, if everything has this constant flow of low, quippy banter kind of running underneath it, and every scene has to end on a little punchline, like someone getting hit in the face or something like that, then if you imagine the film's action as being laid out on a graph, like a line of interest, you just end up with this completely flat tone throughout the entire film. And it's just so polished and smooth that it looks fantastic in some ways from the outside, but it's completely impossible to actually engage with or hold on to. You just slip off it all the time. You know, Kurt Russell's super charismatic, but his character doesn't have any motivation underneath. You've got an awesome soundtrack and great visuals, but they don't underlie any sort of threat. You've got two hours and 15 minutes to tell a plot half of which literally has no bearing on the rest of it. You're talking about a film that is glossy and fun on the outside, but ultimately does not reward engagement fundamentally. One final thought about this is that I always try to look at films in the context of the audience that I see them with. So I gave a really nice review to Fast and Furious 8 recently because the audience loved it and because I could understand why the audiences that it was aimed at would like it. My worry was that when I went to go see this I'd have a similar review where I'd have to grudgingly admit where, that this movie sort of worked for its audience. The thing is the audience wasn't that enthusiastic. It's a midnight screening, they're fans and they're supposed to be sitting there and like loving every moment of it. When I saw the first Guardians that was definitely true even though I didn't like that film at all. This movie, not so much. It was a much quieter screening, um, with the exception of two people who kind of became my barometer for fan reaction to the film. So the guy sitting next to me just snorted, like he like, <laughs> like he loved it. Every joke. <laughs> and then the woman behind me, every time that Groot showed up on screen, little baby Groot, she'd go, oh, Groot, oh, small, big eyes, oh. And if that's the audience you're aiming for, then I think you're going to score regardless of how the film actually pans out. I think if you're aiming for that, then you've lost a lot of respect for your general audience and also for yourself, I think, fundamentally. To each their own, right? That's one star for James Gunn's direction. He did a good job even if I didn't like it. That's half a star for the plot and that's half a star for the characters. So that's two out of five. Guardians of the Galaxy, volume two out of five. Hope you enjoyed my review, or at least you can appreciate the effort of going to see this at midnight, getting home at like 3am and then waking up six hours later to do this review. Do let me know what you thought in the comments down below, I'm aware this will be a slightly more controversial one because a lot of people liked the original movie and a lot of people are probably going to like this too, but I'd love to find out what you thought about it, and in particular if you have like a real argument as to why you think that I am wrong and why I should appreciate the movies more than I do, I'd love you to let me know about that and I'd like to have a read about it and engage with that with you in the comments. Hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to click subscribe to get the next one when it comes out, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Bye for now.